As Laura's mentioned, um, I'm a spacecraft engineer, um, very fun title. So as a thermal engineer, my job is to um, measure and control how the heat moves around on a spacecraft. Um, so space is surprisingly enough, one of those challenging environments. We don't have the protection of atmosphere. So um, at an Earth distance, spacecraft in full sunlight will get to around 180 degrees within half an hour. Equally, the side that is facing away from the sun, so facing just into dark space, is going to reach somewhere around minus 180, minus 200 degrees C, again, within half an hour. Um, so we're playing with some pretty extreme temperatures. You start putting some different orbital control in there, you're changing what side the sunlight's hitting, and everything can start getting a little bit exciting. Um, so what we try and do for thermal control, um, in fact, for pretty much anything on a spacecraft, if we can avoid anything that switches, we will do. Anything that requires any mechanical input, it's, it's a potential risk for failure. As soon as you're switching something regularly, it's not going to last very long. Um, telecommunications spacecraft can be active for around 25 years after launch. Can you think of anything that you own that you have used for 25 years with moving parts and you haven't actually touched it at all and it's done its own thing completely. So um, that's kind of an idea as to what the challenge is. Um, so that, uh, luckily maybe for thermal engineering, uh, we can actually get away with not having too many um, active methods of control. We try and aim for a lot of passive control methods. So one of those is to use some thermal blankets. Um, so this is why I always consider that my job is one of the girliest of jobs because we take something that's incredibly expensive, millions to billions of pounds, and we make them shiny. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is a thermal blanket. Have any of you here ever watched or run a marathon or some kind of race? A couple of nods, brilliant. Um, so at the end of the race, they get given like a, a, a sheet of foil. Um, it's essentially what this is. There's lots and lots of different layers. I'm going to pass this round. Well some similar stuff around. It's made up of lots and lots of different layers. And what the layers are doing is the heat, yeah, I'm gonna do it that way around. Heat gets to one surface and it's going to be reflected away because it's shiny. It's not, nothing is a perfect reflector. So we're going to actually absorb some of the heat. So that particular layer of foil will get hot and then the same thing will happen between one layer and the next and the next and the next. So what we're do doing is reducing how much heat is getting through one layer to the next until you get to the other side of the blanket, so whether that's some side or internal side. So that's, that's how we can control how much heat is coming into the spacecraft and leaving the spacecraft through blankets. As an idea of how effective that is, this 10 layers of blanket, um, so if it's in full sun, 180 degrees on that full sun side, it's going to be at around 50 degrees on the inside of that blanket. So pretty effective. And that's what my little demo is going to be for. Um, do, do I have a willing volunteer? Or do I need to pick somebody out of a crowd? Yeah, please do. Excellent. So we're going to do a proper little school style experiment. So what's your name? Harriet. Harriet, hello, hello. Um, can I have a little round of applause for Harriet for being a volunteer? Thank you very much. <laughs> so, what I've got in the corner here is a, a, is a little IR lamp, so um, it's nothing particularly fancy, it's the same as what you might get in a little reptile cage, um, so it's going to make things warm. And uh, we, have, we have a plate, nice and round, and we have some chocolate. What happens if you put chocolate under, um, under something hot? It melts, fantastic. So that is pretty much what the experiment's going to be. Harriet, can I ask you to arrange these fairly evenly on the plate? All of them as much as you like. It doesn't need to be all of them, just a, a decent selection. Here we are. Yeah, and then if we can spread them around a bit. A uh, bit of fair testing, so that you know I'm not rigging it, basically. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is we're going to cover half the plate with the blanket and then leave it to kind of essentially cook um, under, this, under this thermal lamp. So here we go. So if you can put that fairly equal distance under there, that would be great. Lovely. And then we'll come back to that 
pretty much just before lunch and see how squishy they are. Um, <laughs> that's it. I'll get you to do some <laughs> testing in a little bit. So we've got our fair test set up. So uh, hopefully that's gonna that's got just enough time for everything to get a bit gooey. Um, so I did mention I'm going to pass some of these around. Um, here we go. Um, I'm gonna pass these. Here you go. Have a little squidge. Have a rub. You can feel the different foils in there. Um, so that's that's a little bit about blankets. Some of the other methods that we'll use on there, if we actually want to let heat out the spacecraft, which we do want to do every now and again, um, we use different surface coatings. So that will often be black paint, white paint, or it might be um, tiny mirrors. Anybody here like tiling? <laughs> yeah. So this is the only size that spacecraft mirrors come in. <laughs> um, and I'm going to use my reference point of telecommunications satellite again. Telecommunications satellite have two walls so they're, they're a box they've got four walls two whole walls and they're around six meters by two meters completely tiled in these um it's certainly not a job that i would want to have thankfully as an engineer my job is to decide where the tiles are going not to actually put them on um so, so that's that's a little bit of some of the different techniques that we might use and i'll have a bit of chat with those things later um but now i'm going to actually use my slides i've present i've prepared does anybody know what this is solar panel? it is a solar panel it's one of my favorite images yeah This is, it's not the probe, it's the satellite that took the probe to, to the comet. So yeah, this is the solar array of Rosetta. Um, and yeah, so that is the comet 67P. I can't remember its full name, it's mega long. Um, so the, that, that is the comet that, uh, as it's on its approach to the comet. And Rosetta is a UK mission. It was, so it was retired last year. Um, it woke up, so that was around September time last year. In April last year, the comet had um, actually came out of our hibernation after nine years. Pretty much as many of those functions switched off as possible. So it's been doing all its orbital control completely passively on the very bare minimum of anything it can do. Um, it's been a very long way. It's been out behind Jupiter. It's been above five distances between the Earth and the Sun, um, so 5 AU. Um, <laughs> And it's really unusual that at that distance that we will be using solar rays. So it's ended up having some of the longest solar rays that many, many spacecraft will have. Each of those solar rays is in the region of 24 meters and it's got a pair, it's got two of them. So it folds up pretty small. Um, and actually this image, the reason it's one of my favorite images is because this is essentially Rosetta's own selfie. It's trying to take an image of the comet and its solar rays in the way. There's another one of these images where as it's on a flyby past, past Mars, <coughs> And that image will have taken 14 minutes to actually be beamed back to Earth because it comes through as tiny little pixels. So, and again, that's mainly the reason that it's in, in black and white. Um, so yeah, Rosetta is a UK mission. When we first started doing um, Rosetta, there were four other missions like essentially on the books. Each department had one computer per department. So we've got four or five spacecraft. Nearly everything was designed numerically by hand and the computer models, you would book your time on the computer and you would get 24 hours to be able to run anything. So Rosetta thermal model was around 150 nodes. As a comparison, Solar Orbiter, which is one of the more recent models that I worked on, that's, um, that model now is at around 15,000 nodes and takes about two hours to run. So computing power has significantly changed in the last 20 years, but we work with what we've got because once it's up there, we're not gonna be playing with it. Rosetta, interestingly, we knew that technology was moving at a huge rate when it was launched. So we didn't actually design for anything after it came out of hibernation. So the, its instructions were do all of its whatever it's doing to get where it's needing to be, wake up, send us a signal to say that you're there. And then we started doing lots of communications with the spacecraft. Does this work? Does this work? Does this work? What's the health of that part and this part? And then we send a whole load of new software to update the next section. And then it arrived at its comet and the comet wasn't shaped like a spud. It's more like a rubber duck, um, which was a surprise for everybody concerned. And that's where some of the interesting sections with Feely, which is that probe when it landed on there, um, in terms of actually how to land it on the actual spacecraft. But 
as I'm sure you're all aware, it's been an incredibly successful mission. They've learned a lot of things about comets. And there are further missions in the pipeline that have been discussed with NASA and ESA, so the European Space Agency, in terms of other, other different spacecraft. Um, right. So this, this is the insides of my very first thing in space, which is a bit of a weird phrase to ever be able to say. Um, if you open up any spacecraft, the insides of it pretty much are shiny, um, of the silvery variety, or black. Any idea why we might use black on the inside of spacecraft? Black body radiation. Black body radiation. This man's got it there. Um, so if black is a pretty good absorber and emitter in the particular wavelength that we're interested in, which for me, you, the planet, most of our spacecraft, that's infrared. So it's going to emit and absorb pretty much equally, which means that you can put something hot in that spacecraft and it's going to be able to get short of plenty of its heat. And then at the other end of it, something that's a bit cold can also start and absorb some of that heat. What we're trying to do is to level out any of the temperature gradients that you actually have across a spacecraft. Um, have any of you come across the idea of thermoelastic distortion? I know, they're great phrases, aren't they? You probably have, um, but maybe not with those actual words. Um, so if I have a lump of metal, say about this big, and I heat it up, what's it going to do? It's going to expand. And how about if I cool it down? It's going to contract. There you go, thermoelastic distortion. How difficult is that? Um, well, that's totally fine when you've got a nice lump of metal and it's all heating evenly. Imagine you've now got like a bar of metal and you heat one end and then you contract the other. So everything's starting to get into a bit of a different shape. And then you make that into a lovely structure and you've got heat on one side, but not on the others. And, and that's where you start, we start getting some pretty interesting things. Um, and the same sort of thing, it doesn't actually just have to be the sunlight coming in, it could be instruments being switched on and other instruments being switched off. If you've ever sat with a laptop on your knee for too long, you're, you're probably aware that things start to get, electronics start to get hot as they're actually being used. Um, so Lisa Pathfinder is a technology demonstrator. It's looking for gravity waves. Say looking. Yeah, it's still looking. I think that's going to be finishing in October sometime. It had an extended mission phase. As a technology demonstrator, what we're trying to do is demonstrate that we can build something that can actually detect gravity waves and to see if gravity waves can be detected. It's in an extended mission phase. That means we have actually been successful at detecting gravity waves. The first detections came around at the same sort of time as, I think it's LIGO, one of the underground detectors detected gravity waves. We've also managed to detect them in space as well. The idea with LISA Pathfinder is that the LISA mission would be three of these spacecraft and they'd all be around 200,000 kilometers apart from each other in a big triangle. And so we pick up one and measure the impact of the other so to actually be able to measure the size of a gravity wave. So they're pretty small things. Um, so yeah, this is inside of Lisa Pathfinder. It's looking for gravity waves. Gravity is, surprisingly enough, impacted by mass. So for Lisa Pathfinder specifically, we had to measure every single item on that spacecraft and also measure its response to different temperature <coughs> gradients and then analyse them numerically to see if it was going to behave as we wanted it to. Thankfully, we did, which is a really good thing. <laughs> and we have had cases where it's not always actually come out as we wanted it to, the, um, because the numerical techniques are only so good as your prototype and your testing. If you don't have the data to play with, how do you know what model you're actually building? Um, so that's actually what Lisa Pathfinder looks like in real life, not just the inside of it. So the solar rays under this black blanket, that's just to stop it getting really mucky. Um, and there's a person there as an idea for height, but Lisa Pathfinder is about my height, is the short part here. And because it has all the sensitivity to, to mass, we got rid of any mass that we didn't need during the uh, observational phases, which is all of this silver section here, which is the propulsion module. So the blankets are different colours on Lisa Pathfinder. Anything that's going to be in sunshine will pretty much be a gold type colour. And um, so we expected that we might get some glancing solar input. 
on the actual module itself. The propulsion tanks are wrapped in silver blanket because the idea was that it was just going to be in shadow of the rest of the spacecraft during that phase. Um, so Lisa Pathfinder has been about 15 years in the design, build, test and actual launch for around a nine month mission phase. So they're, they're pretty short lived when they're, when they're the science ones, but the science missions are very bespoke. Um, and then my next one. So this is, this is Solar Orbiter. Well, it's not actually Solar Orbiter. It's an artist's impression of Solar Orbiter. Um, any interesting features anybody can see there? It's all black. So I'll give you an idea. Solar Orbiter is a mission that's going to be the closest thing that mankind has ever sent to the sun. It's going to be a third of the distance between the Earth and the sun, on the sun side of sun to Earth distance. It's going to be within Mercury's orbit. Um, so obviously having it all black, that feels like a funny choice as that to me anyway. And so on the front of this heat shield, that will get to around 700 degrees. And yet the rest of the spacecraft, pretty much all electronics likes to work at comfortable body temperature, maybe even less than just comfortable. Like well, I'm all right about minus 10 with a couple of coats on and 40 for holidays. Well, that's not me personally, but I know some people like that. Um, that's pretty much the range that everything on a spacecraft wants to live at. So they're the sort of two conflicting ideas that we're after when we're, when we're looking about thermal control is not too hot, not too cold, and not too bendy. So no great big changes of temperature gradients. Um, so 700 degrees, this structure is pretty big. Um, the front heat shield is about two and a half meters by two meters. And then it's got a big heat shield. Um, so when I say a big heat shield, that's 700 degrees in the same way as the blankets that have been passed around. It is a series of foils. It's actually five layers of titanium and they're all painted black and it will drop the inside of the spacecraft. So where it actually connects to the spacecraft, it's at around 70 degrees. It's a massive temperature gradient. Um, and the thickness of the heat shield is about this big. So it's the passive technology, it really does work, but we're really, really being challenged with that. Thermally, we're actually all right to design for that kind of thing. It's, it's one of the things that we can, we can use materials differently, we can use the colors, we can size things for that. The challenging part of Solar Orbiter, it's got, it's got an absolutely incredible orbit um, in the same sort of way as what Rosetta did. So this is, this is the Solar Orbiter orbit. Um, so it's got a nice little arrow that says launch. Brilliant. And then it does all these weird loops. Um, its biggest loop takes it out beyond Mars. And it's really cold out at Mars, but we've just designed a spacecraft to be really hot on one side, which basically means we need a whole lot of power to be able to manage that. So it's solar rays again, our huge solar rays, so that we've got enough power when we're all the way back. Um, the solar rays present their own issues. They melt, same as anything when you put them too close to the sun. So as it gets towards the sun, we can't actually keep the solar rays flat. As soon as we're getting towards Venus, we have to start and move the solar rays back, otherwise they'll melt. So we're reducing how much energy we can get on the solar rays. And then there's actually a point at which we get no energy from the solar rays, and that's when we're closest to the sun, because the solar rays are pretty much flat, so any of the light comes in and is actually being completely scattered by the layer of silicon that's on the top that stops them, that, that actually protects the solar ray itself. Um, and in the same way as we did for Venus Express, that each solar ray panel has a row of mirrors in between it. So again, these tiny, lovely little mirrors are just like tessellated in between. So you've got a strip of mirrors, a strip of cells, so that we can actually manage the heat. So you've got a bit of a cold gap in between each section because the solar rays get hot as they're generating energy. Um, I, who, who would be a thermal engineer? It turns out spacecraft are complicated. Um, so yeah, so we've, so we've launched from Earth, we do some kind, we actually go out back towards Mars first before we come back into the sun, um, and that's so that we can get the right acquisition on the orbit. What we're actually trying to do with Solar Orbiter is match up the speed of its orbit with the rotation rate of the sun. So as it comes in towards the sun, it's going to rotate at the same speed, and we can actually map for a much longer duration of time what's going on on the surface of the sun. Um, all solar missions to date have been from around an Earth distance and they look at the sun, which is lovely. But the problem is the sun turns. So if you start seeing some so solar activity, some sunspots and things arriving, like, brilliant, this is great, we've got some good stuff. And then it rolls its way out the corner. So that's kind of the idea is that we can actually track 
how one particular aspect of the surface is going to develop. The other thing that's been heavily on solar physics for, since the 70s is plasma physics. Uh, in fact, that's what I actually did my dissertation on in my undergrad. Um, solar plasma physics has been a big field for quite a long time. And it's, that's the sort of thing that gives us the northern lights and the southern lights. It's the thing that is generated somewhere in the solar corona. Don't know all the mechanisms for that. That's where the research comes in. What we don't have is any spacecraft that are looking at both. We don't have any spacecraft that are looking at the sun and at plasma physics all at once. You might have seen the images of the sun in all its different colours. There's like green ones, blue ones, orangey ones. They're looking at the sun in different wavelengths. Often they're on different spacecraft too. So we've got lots of different data of w different wavelengths of the plasma, different images of the sun and the videos that can be made out of them. But we don't have anything that's all of that together. So that's what Solar Orbiter is going to do. It's got a whole raft of instruments. It's got 34 instruments on it looking at the plasma in seven or eight different wavelengths, as well as five different lenses looking directly at the sun in all those different wavelengths. What it means is the data we get from Solar Orbiter isn't just great data. It means we can look at all the data we gathered since the 70s in the light of all the new constructs that we learned from, from Solar Orbiter's data. So it's a pretty exciting mission if you're a physicist. Um, and then the, the other thing that it does, because you know that's just not enough, apart from going closer to the sun than what it ever done before, it does a, a VGAM manoeuvre, a Venus gravity assist manoeuvre. So we kind of lock it into Venus and use that to slow it down um, so that actually we can start and gain some altitude. So instead of just going straight around the equator, we're going to actually start and be able to look at the poles, which is where the majority of the energy from, for the solar wind actually comes from. And again, that's never been done before either. So Hopefully, solar orbiters should give us some pretty decent data. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely been one of my favourite missions that I've ever worked on. Um, so back to solar orbiter, it's all black. It's going to a really hot place and it's all black. What colour would you like it to be? <laughs> white. Yeah, white. White would be good, all shiny, any of that. So actually, the reason that it's all black is because if you leave things in space for long enough or put them in a very high radiation area for long enough, it's going to go black anyway. So by having it all black to start off with, there's only so far that it can degrade. So instead of it getting to black within three months and starting going like, brilliant, this is, this is definitely what it's like when it's white, but maybe after three months it's black, what are we designing for? We, we know what we're designing for, so that's the reason thermally that it's all black. Equally, it's going to be in a region of very high ion density, so lots of alpha particles, lots of helium particles, um, and actually, that black, the black blanket coating is fully loaded with carbon. It's a bit like a big Faraday cage. Everything needs to be stuck to one another, otherwise it's going to spark. And usually, well, no, I'm saying usually, actually everything goes from hot to cold. Hot is more energy, cold is less energy. Everything's trying to move towards a more equilibrium state. And the coldest part of the spacecraft are these cameras. They're at cryogenic temperatures. So as an idea of that, Front of the heat shield, 700 degrees. Cryogenic camera, that's my, less than minus 180 degrees, colder than, at the same time as this is at 700 degrees. So what we end up with these are these panels here, the same on the other side, and they're radiators. They're radiating heat away from the spacecraft, and that's how we start and control things. So in space, we have radiators and heaters because we have radiators to radiate the heat away and heaters to add more heating when things are too cold. So when we get out beyond Mars, most of that is going to be under heat control to be able to make sure that nothing freezes. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's quite a lot about solar water there. <laughs> um, this here, this, this is Rosetta. This is Rosetta in its test chamber. So this is what a thermal test chamber looks like. Um, and where you guys are sat is a really big lens. It's a big bank of cameras. Well, it's not cameras, sorry. It's a big bank of lenses. And they're usually xenon light bulbs because we're trying to match the profile of the, of, of the sunlight that comes through. So we can't just use infrared. Depending on the spacecraft you're looking at, we can get away with infrared if you're just looking at how the thermal moves. But if you're looking at how things are going to be reflected, we can't get away with that kind of thing. Um, so solar orbiter that's been tested in front of a massive great big lamp 
that instead of just one solar constant, which is roughly what we get on Earth, is actually at 20 solar constants. Can't put any people in that. Um, and actually, it's a vacuum, so you wouldn't want to go in there anyway. <laughs> um, so we test them all in a vacuum because obviously that's one of the massive, massive heat drivers. Why do we test in vacuum? It's a vacuum in space, which is a good start. Um, you won't get convection. We don't get convection, yeah. So as soon as you're in space, you don't get convection. So um, every, all the other different disciplines, they actually do an, an Earth-based analysis, and then they'll do a space-based analysis, because for them, that's really challenging. Whereas thermally, it's like, brilliant, air. We've got at least 40% convection. There are no problems you switching things on here. So it's only when you get back up into space that, that actually things start getting interesting. So our little experiment that we've got going on here that Harriet very kindly set up for us, that's not going to be as effective as if it was in space because we do have about 40% convection just, just by having some air. Um, so on my blankets, that hopefully you all had a little look at, we've got some flying leads. That's because everything... Literally everything on a spacecraft is connected to everything else. They're fully grounded so that we don't get all that sparking. Um, all right, I just can't remember what the... Have I got any other pictures? Yeah. Um, so this, this, is, this is actually three spacecraft together. You might get an idea of that by the tiny people in the corner. Um, they're actually normal sized people. Uh, <laughs> it's just a very large spacecraft. And this is, this is Bepi Colombo. And this is also going pretty close to the sun. This, this is actually going to be orbiting Mercury. Um, and what have we got? We've got three different bits. We've got the Mercury transfer module. That's the bus, essentially. So that's how we separate everything out in spacecraft. And you've got buses and payload. Payload, things that people pay for. Um, <laughs> buses, things that get them there. So Mercury transfer module, which is a full UK design. And then here is the planetary orbiter, which is going to be taking images of the surface of Mercury, and it's going to be looking at its atmosphere. And then on the very top there, that's a lovely heat shield, but inside that there's a smaller spacecraft, and that's a um, MMO, um, magnetospheric orbiter. So it's looking at the magnetic field of Mercury. And the reason that we want to look at the magnetic field of Mercury is because it looks like Mercury may have had, at some point, a similar path to Earth. So it gives us an insight into what we might see in the future in, on Earth in terms of what its structure looks like, how its atmosphere's been, um, yeah, how, how that's developed, and what its magnetic field might actually develop like future. So. We don't just do this science because it's fun. I mean, it's fun. But we are trying to find things. When we're starting to look at different planets, we, it gets reflected back to what we know about Earth um, and how different things are driving together. Um, I think, do, we, do you want to have a go at a bit of testing? Brilliant. <laughs> um, so I've not brought any thermometers with us, but uh, humans are pretty good at detecting change, changes of temperature. <laughs> Um, so we've got two halves of plate. Would if you test the side that's been under blanket, how are they feeling? Are they? Oh, that feels just like regular normal chocolate. That feels like regular normal can chocolate. Can you guess what's happening in the next bit? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so our blanket's been pretty effective under that heat. Oh, there's some blank. There's some uh, napkins there. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Help yourself to some chocolate. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's a rough idea of, of generally most things thermal on spacecraft. The, the, re the reason that thermal is, well, in my own personal opinion, I'm not biased, I promise, is one of the more interesting analysis aspects of, of spacecraft design is because it impacts the whole spacecraft. You, it's very, very difficult to look at just one section and then hope that the rest of it's going to be, around, be okay around that. If you're an electrical engineer, you're going to have to consider noise, you're going to have to consider the amount of power that's needed, what lines you've got going here, there and everywhere. But they can look at one section in isolation and then start and move through a chain. Thermal, you really can't. It's, it's all down to, it's, we're heavily driven by radiative exchange. So temperature to the power four, it is very much what, how much it can see something else. <coughs> So batteries, um, in fact, I'm going to go right back to one of those first slides. Um, in here, if you want to make sure that something 
isn't interacting with the rest of the environment, you wrap it in shiny stuff. Um, look, there we go. So we've got all the electrical harnesses here. The batteries were also covered in a, in a blanket because batteries get very, very, very hot and they get too hot for much of the rest of the spacecraft to deal with. And it means that when it comes to testing that we actually can't always test everything to its upper limits, but we're trying to test the whole spacecraft system. So there's quite a few bits that go into general spacecraft design, but thermal's definitely on the interesting side of things. You get to work with the electrical guys, the mechanical guys, um, mission systems, communications, anything that has power and it's going to get warm, pretty much. Um, yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Oh. <laughs>